um, let's dive in. Uh, there's certainly an overload of information right now. Uh, so our goal for today, among all the different ways you could spend this hour, uh, is to be very practical, ruthlessly practical. Um, it's really to talk about what can we do, what is happening, what's working, what should we stop doing, what did we think was a good idea but actually isn't. Um, and so we're just taking a very concrete lens on the next three to five weeks, three to five months, um, and where human services is now and what it needs, um, and, and maybe how that's different from what we may have thought. So our watchwords are action orientation, concrete, grounded, practical stories um, and lessons. Uh, what we're hoping to do is avoid the word salad of the generalities. Let's be nimble, let's be flexible, let's you know care about, and there's, there's a lot of word salad that you all have experienced. Um, so what we're gonna focus on is, what didn't we know that we know now? What didn't we think was a good idea, but actually it is? What should we stop doing that we maybe thought was a good idea? And how has our thinking changed and evolved? Um, and the reason we're doing this is because the focus is going to be on learning. So there's no recipe book. We're kind of, we're off the rails. We're, we're in a world that none of us um, have been in unless we've worked on global pandemics um, professionally, public health pandemics professionally, which many people haven't. So the goal is not to say what's the right answer. The question is, what are we learning? How are we learning? And how are we getting better um, as we go through this process? So thanks to each of you for being here. Um, we have till the top of the hour, so we thought we'd uh, spend the first uh, maybe 20 minutes, half an hour, um, just focusing on the, getting uh, oriented with our, with our panelists. Um, and then we'll hopefully open it up to discussion and Q&A. So if you have questions, please, please do enter them in the chat and we'll, we'll incorporate them in. All right, so Ruben, if we can start with you. Um, so tell us a little bit about your role in supporting humans, human services organizations. Um, tell us when this crisis began for you, what you've been focused on, and, um, and what are you learning? What do you stop start um, over the last number of weeks? Sure, thank you, Susan. And I really do have to thank you for acknowledging the word salad that's going on. We are all hearing all of these phrases. Government has to be more flexible. Funders have to throw out their, their guidelines and whatnot. Um, the biggest word that I'm living with and that our agencies are living with is disruption. This entire pandemic has completely disrupted the very manner in which human services are traditionally delivered. Um, when you think about it, the agencies that are part of the network of Jewish human service agencies are frontline responders when there's a crisis but they're also the responders every day when there's not a crisis, when there's just people in need in a community who need support, services, and connections. Those connections typically are done face-to-face, -face, in person. And the model upon which human services traditionally are, de are delivered are in those structures of in-person or face-to-face. -face. What this pandemic has done has thrown that model completely out the window and agencies, literally many overnight, needed to transform entire service delivery systems from in-person to virtual. Not an easy thing to do. They needed to rush out and purchase HIPAA compliant platforms, technology that could be used to connect with clients, you know, through the internet. Um, They've needed to restructure the manner in which they use volunteers. They've needed to think through how staff are going to work in terms of working from home and all of the, all the technology and needs that come with that bucket. Um, and they've needed to rethink how they're going to deliver core services like home care for isolated elderly or Holocaust survivors, how they're going to deliver food how they're going to think through, um, you know, support groups and, and therapy sessions, all of that. And while they're doing all of that, many agencies simply in crisis mode simply started delivering services, not knowing if the funding streams would be there to support those service, those service offerings. And we, together with resources through the JFNA, as I'm sure Stefan will talk about, um, have begun to navigate the, the need of advocacy efforts to streamline and to make sure that there is that reimbursement, 
but there are gaps there and there are still pockets that are unclear and unknown. So I could keep going, but that's sort of the beginning landscape of what we're dealing with. Great. And can you share a couple stories about what are some of the things that you think have really um, the people are, have been doing that have they have not had to do before, which you've just shared, and sure. what that has meant for them? Um, what sure. have they had to stop or start? Um, and what does sure. it mean to try to support them in this time? So, you know, I talked about transitioning in-person service models to virtual. And so Zoom has a HIPAA compliant platform. There are about a handful of others out there. Some of our agencies had dabbled in that world. Some were very proficient, most were not. And so they needed to learn both the technology associated with implementing it, and they also needed to figure out um, the legality of providing the service that way. Confidentiality, how will client signatures be obtained? How will fees, if they are at all gonna be provided, how will they be collected? Um, how can we ensure that there's follow-up, again, done virtually in terms of the, the services that are provided? So one of the gaps that we've tripped into, which was very, very helpful um, through advocacy efforts uh, that went on, was this whole telehealth reimbursement structure. And so right now, Medicare and Medicaid have provided flexibility to ensure reimbursement for agencies that provide the service. However, it needs to be provided through a platform that allows for both audio and um, visual technology. Our agencies work with many clients who simply don't have access to computers. They don't have access to smartphones. They don't have either the knowledge of how to use those systems or the Wi-Fi access and the internet connectivity, et cetera. And so the agencies continue to provide services on traditional landline telephones. Again, not knowing if the funding is gonna be there to support those services. So that's an example yeah. of, of things that are happening in, the, in this new unknown um, and, and certainly an example of a funding gap, which we are very concerned. Good, thank you. Um, we'll come back to some of those examples in a minute. Um, Alex, if we can turn to you, tell us a little bit about when this crisis began for you. Obviously, you're in New York right now. We're all seeing it um, on TV if we're not living there. Uh, so what have you been focused on uh, in the last number of weeks and really how has that you know, changed how you, how you think and act? Sure, so if I could make one point alone on this webinar, it would be that we were in crisis prior to COVID-19. There are over 500,000 individuals living in poor and near poor Jewish households in the catchment area of UJ Federation of New York. That's Westchester, Long Island, and the five boroughs. So we've already been on it in regards to increasing service delivery. We have plans in place to double down in all of our employment efforts, sector-based job training, enabling best-in-class employment uh, opportunities to reach the community's most vulnerable, the mounting unemployment lines that we're all paying attention to now become our population. But prior to COVID-19, we were already inundated. So too, we've been in a process of digitizing our food pantries. Never before has that been more important because we have the ability to enable people now to order food remotely from their homes. We were prepared, but we're inundated. There's no better word. I think a significant distinction between the challenge we're facing at this moment and other crises that we've faced as a federation, as a country, and as a globe, for example, 9-11, uh, the 2008 recession, in New York specifically, uh, Hurricane Sandy, what makes this situation so distinctly challenging is the fact that it's not just the clients who are suffering. Obviously, they are suffering and we are trying to support them. But the system of agencies is entirely unstable. So right now, our client base is both the human service organizations who we are trying to strengthen and ultimately the clients whom they serve. The majority of our response to date has been in capacity building efforts. 
to enable organizations, primarily those with uh, delayed or held up human service contracts, to get emergency loans from the Hebrew Free Loan Society, money that UJA Federation to the tune of $20 million has put forward, so that organizations are not in a place of having to make layoffs, furlough employees, while they are waiting either for their government contract to go into place and now through the federal stimulus package. But our support to keep the agencies operating, as Ruben articulated, remotely, virtually, but without the revenue sources that they've historically relied on, even in prior crises, makes this very, very unique. So a community um, center, and I'm not sure how relevant this is across the country, but here in New York, many of our community centers, JCCs, look more like settlement houses than um, primarily shops where people are going to the pool and the exercise uh, facilities, albeit, they're still um, offering those programs as part of the revenue model. So people are paying for gymnastics, although many of the um, services that the community center offers are human services for a more vulnerable population. But if you don't have the revenue stream from gymnastics or art or um, drama, you're unable to secure the staff and the resources that your agency needs to deliver on its human service agenda. And so our work is almost divided into responses that meet the client directly through the agency, which is our sweet spot, and building capacity for the landscape of organizations close to 100 that we rely on in our city and Westchester and Long Island to make good on their mission. That was a very helpful sort of overview and just how things are so different now. And, you know, many organizations were not, did not have strong financial statements, uh, balance sheets going into this. So as you say, um, not only were the individuals, um, there was a large number of individuals in crisis, but many of these organizations have been sort of historically starved for overhead. Um, all of the things like technology, like financial resiliency that have enabled them to, would have enabled them to, to do this more strongly. So, so your stories of where, of where you need to intervene are so, um, so powerful. Uh, Rafi, if we can turn to you, give us a little bit of a sense from the from the private foundation world. You've obviously um, been watching this and been um, interacting with people on the front lines. What are what are you seeing, and what's what's different for you? Well, we took a three pronged approach, I would say, and and I would even say this. Let me let me backtrack for one second. One is um, the first is that about three weeks ago, you know, Rachel, our Rachel Monroe, our CEO, uh, sort of looked around and, and, um, and knew that we had to have some type of response. So she wrote a letter that we released that made three commitments to, um, to our grantees. And first was to extend or, or um, reschedule reporting requirements and deadlines, to be flexible in terms of benchmarks and outcomes, and to no matter what, honor our current commitments. Um, you know, and, and, and uh, I would say, we're developing, we're in the midst of developing short, medium, and long-term responses. Obviously the long-term, we don't know yet what that's gonna look like. Um, for the short-term, what we've done is, you know, last week, um, um, some of you may have seen, you know, we released a, 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 a copy of, um, of 55 grantees that we support, uh, of grants that we've made, uh, around $2.57 million in emergency funding. Most of it is with our grant is with our partners on the ground that we know well. And most of it was around food insecurity, support for homebound older adults, survivors, people experiencing homelessness and other immediate short-term needs that are emergency, I would say. That's triage. Um, like everyone else, however, I think what what philanthropy is talking about, and you know, there was a piece in the Sunday Times um, yesterday about uh, about philanthropy's response that's worth looking at because um, it's using the language that we use, and it's trite to say, but but beyond the emergency food insecurity and 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 figuring out how to support the organizations that Ruben talked about um, transforming overnight, you know, direct services to teledirect services um, or digital direct services including food and, and then beyond that food insecurity, right? 
we really have to wait to respond after we understand what the government is deciding it's going to do. I think what, what we're seeing is that it's a huge challenge because everybody's watching it play out, the tension between local, state, and federal authorities about who is responsible for what. And it's hard to say that we, we are going to wait, but it is very early for us to understand since the situation is literally evolving minute by minute, um, both organizationally but existentially for, men, for, for some organizations, as to how, where the gaps will be. We can't, philanthropy, one thing I will tell you is that philanthropy cannot replace the government. The best it can do is triage where, where it can and then figure out within its own areas of focus, I would say, where are the gaps that the government's response are not addressing? Where is it we can leverage that impact to make sure that, that the partners that we have on the ground can still make a difference? Because the, that, and that, I would say, the one piece I would add to that is from a mid-range response, from a post-emergency response, I would call it, you know, it's gonna be hard to have partners on the ground respond to these emerging needs beyond the emergency if they don't exist. So we have to worry about the existential component of NGOs. In Israel, I can tell you, they're a little bit further ahead of where we are in terms of response to the crisis. But I can also tell you that in the NGO sector, there's now 35 to 40% unemployment. That, that many people have been laid off. Um, and I think the longer it extends here, I think their window is going to be shorter. But the longer we're delayed here, there'll be more and more of that. And I know everybody probably just saw the Macy's is furloughing 100,000 employees as it flashes across the screen. And I can guarantee you that what we're also seeing, and Stefan knows about this way more than I do, is, is the, the lack of support that we, we think we will see from the government for the NGO sector um, in terms of emergency funding. I'll leave it there for now. No, thank you for that. So Stefan teed it up for you perfectly. Um, if people can't, can't wait until the, can't operate until the government operates, um, of course many are. Um, so tell us a little bit about what it looks like from your perspective as you think about what's changed and where things are, are likely to be going. Um, you certainly have a, a little bit of a bird's eye view um, on the policy and advocacy front. Yeah, so representing Jewish federations in North America, my scope is, is national and continental. I'm also a board member of Rubin's organization, so I have that perspective as well. And one thing I wanted to, I guess, clarify from what Alex said, I think the JCCs in New York are obviously a little bit different than the JCCs around the country. Uh, around the country, while most of their revenue is fee for service, uh, these JCCs do provide human services, particularly for congregate meals. And when the fee for services are 80%, the JCC system is coming to a, a virtual halt and is really concerned about, um, you know, business continuity after April 1st. So we started hearing that message um, a long time ago, maybe two and a half weeks ago, uh, that about how concerned they were. And then that was added, uh, the conversation uh, added that the, the day schools were really concerned about their revenue. And then the Jewish Family Service Agencies, even if they um, they were trying to continue their operations, but the revenue uh, was, didn't know what was gonna happen from, from the revenue. So we were hearing this from, from many different perspectives and certainly from federations. Federations are concerned about their annual campaign so that they can, that they can respond to help these, these other agencies in need. And the question was, as a national system, how could we work with our other national partners in the non-Jewish community to respond and, and try to influence the federal advocacy piece? Um, about two weeks ago, um, I, uh, about two weeks ago, there was a coronavirus bill that, that passed Congress. It was a $200 billion package, and that was actually pretty large and had, had gone through the legislative process pretty quickly. In that bill, there actually is human services funding, a lot of funds uh, for uh, nutrition, for instance, that eventually is gonna trickle down to our agencies. We thought then there would probably be a gap between that response and the huge economic stimulus bill that everybody was talking about. And in fact, 10 days later, uh, last Friday, 
Congress had passed a huge bill, $2.2 trillion, biggest uh, bill that ever came out of Congress. And there are a number of things in there that, that we helped uh, to, to place and that, that we worked on that will help nonprofit agencies. The biggest is a program at the Small Business Administration, a $350 billion program uh, that was created for small businesses, but applies to nonprofit organizations. And the big piece of that that is, that is really huge is you can apply for loans for the, from that program. And if you meet certain criteria, 100% of what you apply for can be uh, converted into grants. So that's the biggest piece. And, and JFNA is doing a whole bunch of things to get the word out about this program. There are other pieces in that bill that are really important too. There's some charitable tax deductions that will help with both low donors and high donors that are, that are in that. And then there are billions literally that are set aside for human services, $950 million at the Administration for Community Living, a lot of which is gonna to go to food. Uh, $450 million for the TFAP program, which relates to kosher food banks. 200 million for the Emergency Food and Shelter Program. I, all, all this is, by the way, is there is resources that are coming out of this bill that will translate and trickle down to the communities that we serve. So I'm gonna stop there. So just a quick follow up on that. I mean, as you think about the number of agencies and organizations that are able to understand the legislation, understand the sort of new revenue sources available to them and sort of take advantage of them. So talk a little bit about what that looks like for organizations in the field, because certainly a lot of the nonprofits that I know of <clears throat> may not have advocacy resources. They may not have financial analysts to be able to sort of look at that. They certainly don't have people right now who can spend time with grants and applications and things. So talk a little bit about the capacity to take advantage of that money and what, what it takes um, to get people, um, a large number of people, to be able to um, take advantage of, of all the uh, resources that you just talked about. Thanks. So specifically, I'll talk about the Paycheck Protection Loan, which is, I think, the, the one that you were talking about. And before I get into that, the, the, the main thing that we did in the advocacy piece of, that led up to the economic stimulus bill uh, there had been restrictive language uh, attached to this provision that said, if you got Medicaid funds, you are not eligible. Who gets Medicaid funds? Among other things on this dais, most of Rubin's agencies, or at least uh, most of the ones that aren't small, get Medicaid funds and would have been shut out of that. So that's, that, that restriction is off the table. The main restriction at this point is there is a cap of 500 employees. So the larger social service agencies the larger JCCs are not eligible. Everybody else in our community that's an institution, whether you are a JFS organization or a vocational training program or a nursing home or uh, a day school or, or a synagogue or a federation, uh, what have you, if you are a 501c3 or you count as a 501c3, which a synagogue does, then you're eligible for this program. We have a, a resource, a, a new website that we're working on collaboratively with some of the other uh, big uh, institutional players in the Jewish world, jewishtogether.org. Um, we're, we're putting all of the information up there. We're having a whole series of, of webinars. We have um, phone lines and email, dedicated emails to help people figure out how to apply for this program. Um, we'll have volunteers that will be able to walk through those small agencies who don't have the wherewithal to do it. And as far as we know, the SBA is going to pass out the information on this program um, beginning in the next couple of days. Um, you apply through a local SBA affiliated bank. Uh, we have lists on the on the website uh, for that purpose. And um, the, the other thing to know is this is a first come first serve program. It's $350 billion, which seems large, but you should know that there are mm -hmm. approximately 3, 3 million uh, small businesses and 1 million uh, nonprofits that are eligible for it. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, we're unsure how long 350 billion will last. And in fact, probably in the next round of our advocacy, we're gonna be going back and asking for more. 
Good. So let me, in the next round of, of discussions and comments, I'd like to hear just a little bit about what does this mean? What, what can grant makers do, philanthropists do, people who are concerned about this um, and who are not necessarily working full time in a nonprofit agency? Um, and just to, to tee that up, uh, some of my colleagues at BridgeBand wrote a piece, which is now on the BridgeBand.org website. It's free, um, which is some thoughts about what philanthropists can do. And I'll just share three of the ideas from that. One is that given the stock market is going through an economic crisis of its own right now, um, certainly there are a number of people who are worried about their grant awards. Um, our you know, funders had made commitments, galas are being canceled. Um, so one thing that funders can do if they care a lot is to sort of stay with it, right? Don't, don't pull back um, and stay, reassure grantees. Um, uh, Vu Lee, who uh, writes the blog Nonprofit AF, um, also sort of speaks to that as well on his blog of just how do you think about reassuring um, organizations, not only that you will honor commitments, but that you will really lean in here. Um, the second is a sort of a set of flexible supports um, that can be provided, taking off the restrictions, taking off um, re reporting requirements and, and all kinds of things, and really letting people um, think about what are the best ways to deploy money right now. And, and Ruben, I think you could probably speak to this as well as to what that could look like. Th there are many others. I'll just I'll point to one more, which is really understanding the full implications of what grantees need and how that's changing on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. So even just asking, what do you need? What do you need right. now? Um, what kinds right. of things aren't you able to do that you need to be able to do? Um, uh, Anthony Bug Levine of the Nonprofit Finance Fund wrote about this as well. There's a whole group of um, foundations, not only in the Jewish world, but also in the general nonprofit world um, through the Council on Foundations website that are really committed. Um, I want to say there are about 450 organizations through the council. There's you know JFNs. There's a, sort of a number of organizations that are really trying to, or philanthropists who are trying to think about what these best practices are. So tell us a little bit about, from your perspective, which of those resonate for you um, and, and what you're seeing. So if we could start with you, so, Ruben, that would be great. Yeah, so if I could just jump in, I think that um, your last point about just speak to the agencies and try to stay in frequent contact with them because the situation is evolving so quickly. What, what your needs are on Monday aren't necessarily your needs on Wednesday. And I have a perfect example to share with you all, which I think is very concrete and um, could demonstrate a real role for funders uh, to be responsive today and to provide, frankly, life-saving support. About two weeks ago, literally, at, toward the very beginning of this whole effort, um, I heard from some of our agencies who were struggling already with access to personal protection equipment, PPE, masks, gloves, surgical gowns, um, you know, hand sanitizer, resources that could really protect caregivers as well as protecting clients. Our agencies are no different. Uh, they, just like the government and the hospitals can't access these resources, our agencies can't access these resources. And so, um, like, Crises really bring people out and they bring partnerships out in ways that you don't really always expect. And so I was in dialogue with um, a partner organization in the Jewish community called Kahal, which supports Jewish students in study abroad programs. Those programs were abruptly ending. All of a sudden, hundreds and hundreds of schools were sending their college students back home and the colleges at home weren't necessarily letting them re-enroll because they had signed on for study abroad. Um, and so Kahal reached out to the network to try to get some support for those students. They needed emotional support, mental health support. They needed financial support. They needed volunteer support. They needed perhaps some vocational support to try to find jobs. Literally overnight, as we're beginning this rollout campaign, I simultaneously was getting requests from agencies around PPE, desperate requests. Agencies providing home care for survivors where caregivers were saying, I, I can't go into the home. You know, I, I myself am not safe going into the home. Um, and, and agencies that provide hospice services. And so, 
in sharing these concerns and trying to figure out ways. In the early days, we thought volunteers could find these products. Early days were only two weeks ago. Okay, so we were a little ignorant. Um, and so two weeks ago, we thought, oh, these university students could help us. They could get the products. Well, that didn't happen, but instead, Kahal worked with the network, and I brought in also our sister association in the Jewish community, AGIS, which is the Association of Jewish Aging Services, which supports Jewish nursing homes and senior living communities, um, because we were all in crisis. Nursing homes were not able to find these products either. And together with support from JFNA, in the span of about a week, we were able to mobilize through some overseas vendors and some generous donors who helped fill in some distribution gaps. We were able to mobilize about $1.7 million in purchasing through vendors, not in the US with the exception of one product, the rest were overseas. Um, and within the next few days, the products are going to get to our agencies. We helped about 100 agencies in our system um, in a matter of days. There are gaps in that service model. There are going to be funding needs in terms of agencies that either didn't get their request in or they minimized their request. Um, there are going to be distribution shipping expenses there are going to be some communities that are small communities that are going to really struggle with access in the ways that maybe a larger city won't, or there are going to be large cities that are going to struggle in ways that a smaller community won't. Inevitably, right. we are going to find gaps here, and the members of the Jewish Funders Network could be life-saving resources to help fill okay. that in. I never thought I would be in the mask and glove and gown supply business, but Again, overnight, we played that role. Good. Alex, talk to us about this from your perspective as you kind of see some of those immediate needs change, you know, what the, what's coming in and what's changing rapidly. And, and, and how do you as a grant maker uh, sort of help with that, especially if somebody needed something on Monday, they don't need it Thursday. Mm. You can imagine that that would cause people to pull back and say, maybe we shouldn't do anything because we could do something. We could put all the money in and then it's gone because we don't need it four right. days later. So how do you respond in those situations? Well, I think what people need on Monday, they still need on Thursday and they need a lot more things on Thursday. At least that's the trend that we've been seeing. Um, again, from the perspective of a federation that is um, responsible and has very close relationships with a myriad of organizations, I do believe that the donor community um, is more, it is more prudent to go through an individual or a set of individuals like the team at local federations that have their hand on the pulse of need and coordinate amongst so many dozens and dozens of providers. The agencies are inundated. So the, the degree that uh, interested donors can approach a local federation and ask them what they're seeing, I believe that we will have a far more streamlined approach to getting the resources that are absolutely necessary. So I just want to give you a few examples of things that we're seeing here in New York by way of illustrating the degree of the challenge. And because we're health and human service oriented, I'm going to focus specifically on uh, food and some other uh, related items. But this is just a sliver of what we are grappling with. So right here in the New York area, uh, the, the uh, Federation in New York has a wonderful partner in the Met Council on Jewish Poverty. They really serve as the central repository for kosher protein from both the Food Bank and from City Harvest, an organization that's local here. They re redistribute that food to 30 locations on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Pre-Passover, the list of 30 locations on an annual basis increases to 130. With our funds and the funds of others, Met Council on an annual basis prior to COVID is able to reach the mouths of 181,000 individuals. Now that we have a challenged um, food supply, that we have more competition for prices, 
our situation has exacerbated significantly. So vendors that were lined up to supply food Passover are very much in flux because of the run on groceries and they can really make more of a profit selling to retail outlets. So we have had to respond immediately with financial resources that we didn't anticipate. Specifically, last week, there were 40,000 dozen eggs that needed to be secured for orders. 2,100 units of matzah that the original vendor was no longer going to deliver. The matzah that they purchased last week was one and a half times more expensive than what they had been slated to pay. The chicken vendor had not fulfilled the committed order and increased the price by slightly less than 10% for the remaining 300 cases of chicken. Each chicken case has approximately 38 pounds of chicken. Their warehouse was inundated. They had to rent mega freezers and cold storage, increase their electricity bills in order to be able to bring in the product that was required and we were then paying for it through the Federation off of the philanthropic dollar because the vendors had bailed. This is just one example, one sliver of a huge mm. challenge. And I believe if the donor community could hear these stories, if we can quantify for them, if we can um, show a picture that is tangible, there will be a very meaningful response. So we are in this sort of um, schizophrenic modality at UJA Federation of New York because our annual campaign will presumably be quite challenged. And yet we're seeing generosity from people that we couldn't have even imagined once they hear the stories. I'll give you one other, and I have so mm -hmm. many. Um, the CUNY system, like so many of the universities and colleges throughout the country, moved to remote learning. When your students are coming from low-income households, and we know specifically within the CUNY uh, colleges that have strong Hillels, most of those students are first-generation American, they're not coming from families that are significantly resourced. They don't have the tech. They don't have the Wi-Fi to go rem to remote learning. They don't have the computers. They don't have the ability to simply log on like other students do. So these are places where we were responding quite significantly as well to ensure that the normal uh, requirements of life continue to happen. And it's mm. because we have deep relationships with our organizations, whether that be Hillel and that council and so many others, we're yeah. able to know exactly what to provide the donor base by way of a response. Yeah, now that's such a powerful set of stories because I think if you think about all of the places where we're getting sort of seeing on television, there are lots of medical responses um, and the medical impact. But I think as you think about you know wage workers, people who are in the category, they don't get to work from home on a regular basis. They're not fully kitted out with a a, a home office. They have faced this impossible choice of going to work, risking infection, or at least directly against some of the you know increasingly restrictive shelter-in-place public guidance guidance because work from home is either unavailable for right. this job category um, or, you know, they're, and, and at the same time, they're potentially leaving children or, or older adults um, in the care of other children um, or just not going to work, losing the wages and, and not having a paycheck. And those are, those are pretty immediate financial right. consequences. So, you know, and, and that is if they even still have a job after this. And so I think if you think about some of the places where, um, I don't want to even call them invisible effects, they're invisible to some people, they're enormously visible to others, or child care, you know, leaving their child with, um, you know, others uh, to while they go to work, daycare centers are closing, schools are closing, and they're leaving their children with other, again, either older children or possibly ill family members or in family daycare situations with five other families who are all coming and then going back. I mean, a lot of the things that we're seeing on TV in terms of medical advice, it's pretty much, you know, a, I don't want to say a, a, a white collar um, set of recommendations, but there are many, many people who can't do those things uh, for a whole variety of reasons. It's just uh, social distancing is not realistic, physical distancing. Um, you should just so, know also, yeah, Susan, if I could just weigh in, um, the white collar population that I think the presumption is that the Jewish community generally represents is still a community supported by 
the population that is not white collar. So we are incredibly concerned about isolated older adults who live alone, who depend on caregivers, home health aides, who simply, again, don't have the PPE that they need in order to provide the support. Um, one of the gaps that we've identified is, that I, I mentioned before, the agencies just went off and purchased through the distribution system that we were able to set up but they purchased at a markup that was very significant, mm -hmm. very significant. So there's a gap between what their normal operating budget would support and what they needed to pay simply to get the products. Right. That gap is an area of the philanthropy that donor support could help to protect. Right. And I absolutely. Think that, oh, please, I go ahead. I wanted to underscore the point that Ruben uh, began to make around social isolation. This is huge. So we have known for a while that older adults um, are one of the most food insecure communities, uh, represent one of the most food insecure cohorts in our region. But often when you go into the homes of the clients who are um, presenting as food insecure, there's actually food in their apartment. But because they're not reminded to eat, because they live lives in isolation, yeah. very regularly people forget the value of nutrition and they're too sad to eat. It's a mm. real thing. Yeah. So for middle income communities, not just the most economically vulnerable, but folks who now because of their age have to stay at home or because they were um, receiving nutritious meals in a congregate setting, like Stefan had alluded to in our community centers, those meals are now being delivered to people's homes, but the isolation often prevents people from eating. So we're trying to think of a number of interventions uh, to bring more connectivity into people's lives whether it's universities without walls, places for people to be able to connect with online learning, online community. But if you don't know how to do Zoom, and so many of us don't, these right. opportunities become meaningless. No, it's so true. And I'm sure many of you read the um, opinion piece by Asaf Batan, um, who's a Harvard Medical School uh, physician uh, in USA Today. It was syndicated pretty widely about how important um, the, social, the, the physical distancing is um, and how, how complicated that message can be, um, especially when you know, we're not ready to kind of react and retool as, and because this is something that does affect every income group, but you know, children who are, have special needs <clears throat> or people with disabilities who require services, Ruben, as you were talking about, they're not getting them from the school system, which they had been getting them. It's $14 billion a year is just um, free and reduced lunch programs from our schools. At any rate, um, there are places where you know, mental health, uh, there are just a number of places where uh, these are challenging recommendations. Uh, I want to give uh, Stefan and Rafi a chance to, to weigh in. And then if there are questions on the chat, we'll, we'll open it up to there. But what are, you, what are you hearing and what other thoughts do you have on this? So the, the, what I wanted to put on the table we think that this uh, Paycheck Protection Loan Program is potentially a game changer for the entire system to allow our organizations to provide these vital human services. What we don't know is exactly how long it would take these funds to be distributed. And Alex talked about this loan program that is in New York. There, there very well might be a gap between today and when the funds come that we'll need philanthropy to step in to either make grants to these organizations or to make loans to these organizations before they're able to tap into, the, into that money. But I just wanted to lay, since we're talking to JFN, wanted to lay that out there. You know, one thing I would say is, um, which was mentioned before, and I forgot to say in the beginning, the, the key thing I would say to my fellow um, colleagues who are at foundations or funders out there is um, which you probably already into it is understand what the needs are on the ground. They are evolving quickly. Try to figure out how to be in constant communication with your grantees and partners without being a total nudge. And um, and yes, the word flexible does come up, but understand that that it completely evolves, and the needs in a week from now will probably look a lot differently than they are right now. So, constant communication keeping that flow open is both, I think, comforting for the grantee, but also for the funder in, in terms of not feeling helpless, in terms of how you can assist and how you can help out. Um, there are all different roles to play, but I would just say, um, and this is not blowing smoke, I'm, 
I we're very, very lucky that the field has the excellent professionals that it does, including the, the three panelists on um, my fellow panelists on here who are just have the pulse of what is needed at the right time. Good. So we have about 10 minutes left. Um, if folks have questions, please um, put them into the chat. I see there were a couple that were already answered um, by panelists, uh, but if there are others, please just put them in the chat. And in the meantime, I think it'd just be helpful to hear from each of you uh, as you think about like kind of one or two lessons that you would hope philanthropists or funders can kind of take away or others who want to be supportive in this time. And Rafi, you just gave us a couple, which was great. Um, what are one or two things that maybe we thought it was a good idea and it, it just isn't um, that we should stop doing? And what are things that we should, we should start doing over the next three to six months as this, as this plays out? So, so personally, I think that agencies are used to, our whole system is used to a model whereby agencies apply for an RFP, or agencies um, submit a, a request during a, a certain time frame. I think there need to be safe venues for funders to simply have check-in conversations with, with agencies and other frontline responders, not necessarily around a request, just around education and keeping the forum open for dialogue. I don't think enough of that happens normally um, and I think this crisis gives us the opportunity to open those channels of, of communication and conversation. On what Rafi had said, my office, the Washington office of JFNA, is both a grantee and a grantor. And I know as a grantee, we have appreciated the foundations reaching out to us, talking about the flexibility in, in terms of reporting requirements and spending requirements and that kind of thing. And that was very reassuring. Similarly, we run a pretty large Holocaust services grant program, and we know that everything is up in the air in terms of our grantees doing the work that they promised to do, and we've been much more flexible, and we're working with the, uh, the federal government who provides much of the money to allow for that flexibility, and the grantees have really uh, said how much they appreciated um, the, the, well, the, the way that we're communicating to them and about this flexibility. So I think it's important on both on both sides. One, one thing I would add is, um, is that you don't necessarily as a funder have to change immediately your focus and change everything and drop everything. You can hit pause, you can be thoughtful, you can say, what are the needs? You can say, hey, within my areas of focus, how is this transforming um, our process. Maybe we change our process or our strategy around what we're funding um, within our area of focus. But if you do change it, you have to you have to think about what speaks to um, to your foundation or, or or your family in terms of the sense of response that you want to have. It has to connect with you in that sense, um, not just from a charter perspective, but from 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 the values perspective. But I would say what, one thing that we're thinking about in, in certainly in, in our funding is, is not changing our focus, but saying, what will the next 12 to 18 months look like and how will it look different than normal? And maybe that's okay. And I think it's okay to do that. Yeah, talk about the long-term. There was a question in the chat about long-term ramifications. Um, and so if you could talk about that for, Sorry, there were two questions. One was, what are the long-term ramifications? And then the second is, who's most vulnerable and what do we do now? So there's that push-pull um, of both of those. So I, Alex, you look like you were about to start saying something, but tell us about those. Well, I, I wanted to make somewhat of a separate point, if that's okay. Oh, go ahead, um, go ahead. Just all of the, um, I wanted to know that we are providing funding for consultants to support agencies in the SBA application process because we recognize that that takes a unique skill set. And as Stefan mentioned, so much of this is going to be on a first come first serve basis. So we are trying to do whatever we can through our grant money to enable organizations uh, that sit in our orbit to access as many resources externally from us as possible. So the more that we're able to support their efforts in that regard, we think that we'll see um, the impact. Good. 
And let Good. me add on to, to answer Jeff's question. The SBA typically has had a fairly difficult uh, application process. This program that I'm talking about, it was intended to be set up with streamlined, me streamlined mechanisms. You actually don't apply through SBA, you apply to your local bank. We're gonna, we're gonna have nationally resources to walk people through it. We haven't seen the application uh, yet. That should be uh, released within the next few days. Um, but again, it's supposed to be a simple process with, um, and we'll see whether that, that happens. We, we're hoping for the best, but we're obviously preparing for the worst. If it's more complicated than we anticipate, we'll provide additional resources. Good. So we have about a minute or two left. Um, and Rafi, there was a question in the chat about how should the National Affinity Group and by extension JFN uh, help respond um, in this in this time about their activities, about what what they can do. And certainly, you know, we can learn a lot from you know the, the literature around crisis management. Right? There's a there's a pressure to provide a quick answer. Um, in situations like this, many of the quick answers turn out to be wrong. And not only that, if it was a right answer, it will change, as we, as we just said. And so when we don't fully understand the situation and it's changing anyway, um, how might we sort of help organizations think about a, a long-term problem-solving process um, that, that can be flexible and adaptive, not to, we've done an hour without those words, which is great, um, but to really sort of respond, but while also kind of keeping an eye on the long term. And certainly there are people at, um, I was actually just on a webinar at Harvard Business School, at, at other places as well, about what are the leadership imperatives during this time and, and what do we need to set up um, to be supportive of that sort of, you know, learning environment. So, so talk a little bit about what, what, what can be done and what can be done to support uh, these organizations at this time well I think I think it's it's a mix it just like the affinity group is is both national and local in its approach in general I think the same same thing has to hold true we have to constantly be in touch with Ruben and Stefan and and understand the national picture and the national ramifications but the affinity group is really based around understanding what the needs are talking amongst across organizations, media, research, philanthropy, direct services, all, all different parts of the sectors to understand what, what is a holistic approach we can have that goes beyond our own specific building initiative, angle, lens, et cetera, that we can understand where the, the issue is and how we can alleviate that together holistically effectively. I know it's a little bit cagey, but what I will say is that you know, we were all supposed to, uh, the affinity group was supposed to meet in Dallas in the beginning of May um, with the network's annual conference. And obviously we're not going to be doing that, but, but do stay tuned to what will be an ongoing series, I think of understanding of learning, of shared learning about what is out there, what solutions are happening now, what emerging needs are happening now so that we can as a group uh, decide together. The one thing I would say is if you are not a member of the affinity group, um, you know, it's, I, I think, I, I, I call membership, it's like blob tag. Once you're in, you're in, and you're part of the group. And our threshold is you have to promise a commit to doing more for poverty throughout whatever your lens is than you've done in the past year. And so that's, that's not a big threshold. And, and I think this situation, if ever, calls for it. And for those who are not familiar with direct services um, as funders, I'm happy to talk offline. Dina Fuchs at, at um, JFN is also a leader of the Affinity Group, as is my brilliant colleague, John Hornstein um, at, at, uh, at Weinberg Foundation. And so the other thing I would add to that is last thing, we need your ideas. If you have ideas, come and talk to us because we're really about empowering the field to work together and be supportive to approach this from a holistic standpoint. So we never pretend to know the answers. The answers are usually in the field. We just have to listen to each other and work together to get there. Good. Well, it's the top of the hour. I wanna say thank you to all four of you again. Thank you, Tamara, for organizing us. Thank you to Dina Fuchs for organizing us as well. 
Um, this is obviously a moment where we're seeing data all over uh, the, the screens, all over our TVs and our, 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 our uh, iPads and, and iPhones. Uh, but the power of storytelling is so, so important. And your experiences, all four of you, with the people who are doing this work and the challenges they're facing um, and the lessons you've given us are, are enormously helpful. So thank you. Thank you. This is a difficult time and you're about to go back off this phone and do difficult work. Uh, but thank you for being here. And thank you to everyone who's joined us on the webinar.